fantastic. Um, such a good film. I always forget how amazing it is. Um, just unmuting all the panelists. It's um, helped me with that. For some reason, I can't unmute Vanessa. Um, so a special thank you to Vanessa and Carlo. As Georgie already said, um, fantastic work on that. Carlo directed it. Vanessa produced it. Um, Carlo of Descent Projects um, has made a bunch of amazing films for different causes. So we are very lucky that they volunteered to make this for us. Um, and as mentioned as well, we've got Denise with us. So we've got um, a couple of questions that have come in in advance. So we're going to start with those. But everyone watching, if you have any questions on the film, um, or the making of the film, or um, any medical questions. We've got Denise for that as well. Um, Denise will be giving us a bit of an update on what's been happening um, uh, first um, since the film was made, because the film was made a couple of years ago. So we've been um, going onwards and upwards. And so she'll be filling in on um, us a little bit on what has been happening since the film was made and what's going on in the current situation over there. Um, and then we will go to uh, Vanessa with some questions. Um, but first, uh, Denise, it probably makes sense if you give us a little bit of an update on uh, where we are since the film was made. Certainly. Uh, I like speaking about the hospital very, very much. It is a wonderful hospital and wonderful work goes on there. As you can see from the film, which is excellent, it shows the work very well of the hospital um, from day to day activities. Now, a lot has happened since the film was made, which was kindly done by Vanessa and Carlo. Um, I think it's more than two years old. I think it's probably about five or six. But anyway, I'm just going to go through the different areas so you know how things have developed. Taking East Jerusalem, our main hospital, which is in Sheikh Jarrah, this is going very strongly. And we now have um, a new day case surgical unit which is next to the main operating theatres. When I was last out there, I went to see one of the surgeons operate and he did 12 cataracts in a morning, which is amazing. Excellently done and very good results. And we have a new laser in the hospital. Moving on to the Muristan, which is the hospital on the original Crusader site. Um, and it's very near the Holy Sepulchre. There is a clinic there and patients or people that have eye problems in the old city can go in there. Above the clinic, there is a museum and this is developing very well. And above that on the roof, if you stand on the roof, you have to do this if you go out there. It's a wonderful view of the Temple Mount area. And to the side, there is a cafe area. We haven't got a permit for this to function yet, but it won't be long. So that is the Muristan. Now going on to Hebron, which is in South Palestine, the hospital is new and it's very good indeed and very active. It is actually- Can I just um, interrupt to just say that it was very kindly funded by Priory of Scotland and the Knights Templar and we've got loads of those um, representatives here today. So big thank you to them. Right. Carry on Denise, thank sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you how well it's doing then. And um, it's in a very good position because it's now in the center of Hebron and the patients can get there very easily. There is also an operating theatre and um, this is functioning very well indeed. Um, going up to Anabta, which is in North Palestine, it's between Janine and Nablus. That doesn't do surgery, but it's very, very busy because there are many diabetics in this area and a lot of them um, have the retina being involved. It's called diabetic retinopathy and they knew, need laser. So they will be referred down to East Jerusalem um, to have the laser. Now going to Gaza, you saw the hospital being built. This has now been opened. It's a beautiful hospital and um, it is actually very, very active and it's got two operating theatres. I'll tell you later about the situation um, because of the virus, but um, because there are only 20 cases of the virus, COVID-19, in Gaza, um, the hospital has been to be able to function 70% uh, as it's of its usual rate, which is really very good. Now, outreach, unfortunately, um, outreach has not 
had gone on so well during the lockdown. Um, everybody knows that we have to have outreach, a very important part of the hospital, because the patients find it very difficult to get to East Jerusalem. This is because of the wall. You saw a big photograph of this wall over 500 miles long and the checkpoints. There are also roads, they're called settlers roads and there are curfews and many, many problems. So it is difficult. We used to have an outreach van going out every day of the week, but now um, it's really only about once a week. But soon as the lockdown is easing off, although um, sometimes the Palestinians are anyway sealed off to some extent, um, it'll be functioning again. You saw it very well there. You saw the van being loaded up with the equipment and they can un take out the equipment within about 10 minutes to quarter of an hour and set it up. And I've done, I really enjoyed outreach. I've done it many places. I was just going to tell you once, it was in a cafe and um, the owner realized it was an eye clinic and he was making carrot juice for everyone and thought this was great for, for their eyes. Anyway, I've done it in the back of a mosque, in refugee camps, in isolated villages everywhere. And one particular place, like if you've been out to the West Bank, is Sebastia. It's actually a Christian village and um, it's a Greco-Roman place. And before we started outreach, we'd have breakfast so we could keep going for the day, just as you'd see about 60 patients. And we'd have hummus often, um, cucumber and tomato, very nice, and pita bread. And what we do, and we used to have this in Sebastia on a Roman column, it's very interesting. So then we do it, and um, we, the patients, apart from seeing the patients, the nurses would actually teach the patients how to put drops in, and especially sort of saying that they must use drops in Ramadan, etc. And um, also the health, the diabetes, how they used to take their tablets or um, take their syringe. So it's very, very good. Um, and uh, then the patient, you could do minor procedures there. Like if it was a blocked tear duct, you could wash out the tear ducts or you could do cyst of the lids. But major surgery would be referred um, either to Hebron, if you're in that area, or down to East Jerusalem. Going back, I'm just going to tell you a little about the situation that's been going on with the COVID-19 virus. Luckily, in the occupied territories, which includes East Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza, there were only 100, five, this is recorded on the 19th of May, there were 567 cases, um, just over 300 in the West Bank, about over 100 in um, East Jerusalem, but only 20 in Gaza. This is amazing because if there had been many cases like in some other countries and especially if they'd gone into a refugee camp it would have been disastrous so um, i think as the uh, as the palestinians say kula minala everything is from god and alhamdulillah as the patient that had cataract surgery was saying so that is very lucky now i think actually i've probably been talking a little bit too much and um i think george you might like to ask um, vanessa or carlo to say a few things um, well, I would actually like to jump in and ask Vanessa about um, her involvement with St. John, how she got involved with St. John, and um, and what was the experience that led her to um, making this film for us? <laughs> well, I must keep my answer short because there's so much many more things to um, be shared and communicated most particularly in my view, Diane, from Carlo, because he went out there. I was supposed to go with Carlo and our cameraman and our sound, which was actually my grandson, Carlo's son, Raphael. But I can't remember, I got ill or something anyway, prevented me from going, um, so I didn't go. I've been close to a fief Sophia and Crystal Sophia for many, many years. And um, uh, also to Edward Said before he died, and of course, and with his widow, Mariam C. Said. So, and her brother and many others, in, mainly in Lebanon. 
So um, I've got a lot of history, which I won't go into now, if you'll forgive me. Um, and so how we came to make the film, it was presented to us, and I think you have to ask Carlo, because he remembers more clearly than I do. But we knew immediately, because we have this small film production company, which we're very proud of, because we do some good work. In, and this film, Eyes of St. John, is part of that work. And this year, we had hoped to fund an extra mobile van for the outreach. Um, this was before lockdown. And uh, so we donated quite a few thousands from our very small company and our very small purses, but in relative terms, quite a lot of thousands towards there being another mobile outreach van. It wasn't quite enough, as I understand, to cover the costs of one whole extra van, but we knew how urgent it was. So that's always in my mind. What's coming up? What are St. John trying to do? What's, what's ahead? What are their goals? So I find it extremely both encouraging, but also inspiring to be, and by inspire, I don't mean it as one of these nice words. I mean like a push, a push to get on and help with very important practical things. So the film has helped people know what's involved, I know, and it is of course also. We've Can't had such you. positive feedback from the film. And um, I'd love to hear in the chat if anyone has any questions for Vanessa. In the meantime, I'll move over to Carlo. Yes, I want to ask Carlo about his experiences. Come now, it's the, his answer to your question. Yes. I didn't give the answer. Um, would, no problem. We'd love to hear from you, Carlo, how you got involved with St. John. How was it? We know your, your company, Descent Projects, is very used to filming um, difficult situation. So how was it filming in, in occupied territories? The, well, the experience we had uh, uh, filming was, was really, really remarkable and in, in many ways in that uh, in some ways it was, um, we had the sort of assistance, the sort of help that a filmmaker can only dream of because, um, because of the incredible work that St. John does and the trust that it creates uh, amongst local people, the communities uh, in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, but also amongst the Israelis, as we saw in the film, amongst Israeli communities, um, via its relationship with Hadassah. So um, in many ways, we had um, the way paved for us, despite uh, the wall, despite the checkpoints, despite to the um, the permits one needs, of course, is, and you know very well about that, Diana, that are required for filming, but uh, the assistance we received was really second to none. Um, and that really is testament to St. John, to the impact St. John has, uh, as I said, the trust that it creates amongst all communities. Uh, and um, and the, the way that it builds these bridges, uh, and that's what was really remarkable to me uh, in, in terms of the experience was these extraordinary bridges that are built and somehow things get done. They get done in ways that other organizations can't. Um, so the, I mean, I would say, you know, the, the way we were, we were welcomed uh, in, in the West Bank and in all the territories was just extraordinary. Just the warmth, people preparing food for us and, uh, just making us feel part of the family, a very large family, because St. John, is, as we all know, is, is like a very large family. And once you become involved with St. John, you sort of feel attached to it for life, I guess. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, I mean, I remember, though, Gaza was a little tricky, uh, just so that it doesn't all seem like it was a bed of roses, because we had very, very limited time to film in Gaza. It's a very difficult place to, to do that, to film in terms of getting permits and going through checkpoints. Uh, we had to go through obviously three checkpoints, the Israeli one to get through into that sort of no man's land that separates um, Israel 
and and Gaza itself is a sort of no man's land that's um, obviously very very um, fiercely guarded. And um, and then going through the the checkpoints through the Palestinian Authority checkpoint and the Hamas checkpoint, and those 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 are a little bit tricky. More more actually on the return returning from from Gaza because. Uh, Things got a little bit trickier, but thankfully we had uh, lovely Paul Williams, who at the time was uh, was helping uh, at uh, at St John in, um, with um, Brigadier Tom um, Ogilvy, Ogilvy Graham, the former CEO, and uh, he just really sort of <laughs> wove an extraordinary spell over everyone there, and somehow got us out in time so that we weren't sort of stranded. Uh, stranded in in uh, in Gaza and in no man's land, but but as I said, just uh, the extraordinary assistance we received from everyone, from all involved, St. John, but also the local people. Just, I mean, these are these are memories I will never ever ever forget. Um, Isla, who actually featured on the film, um, she was the director of funding at the London office at the time, and I worked for her at the time. Um, she's asking what your lasting memory is of filming um, and in your time in Palestine. I know you just said you had lots, well, but what was the well, one takeaway? Well, I, guess, I mean, I, I, I touched, I touched on it, but I, I think um, the tears, the tears of people, the gratitude of people um, seeing, particularly the mobile outreach units, I have to say, going out on, on mobile outreach units, which actually I did before the filming, because if you remember, I came out months before to do a recce, uh, prior to going out for the, for the filming itself. And I just remember, literally people tears in their eyes grown up tears in their eyes they couldn't believe that people actually care that they actually care about these people they think they feel forgotten they feel like no one cares they're just isolated they're left to their own uh their own devices with very little very few resources and just seeing that there is care that someone actually cares that there's some love out there that people would actually want to treat them regardless of their ability to pay, which of course they don't have any ability to pay. That is one of the most enduring um, images for me is tears in people's eyes, you know, adults and children, you know, disbelief that there's such a, an organization like St. John to, to care for their eyesight, which does of course you know, save not just their eyesight, but saves their, their lives as well. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much. I think this question will go, the next one, will possibly be going towards um, Denise and maybe Georgie. Um, you mentioned that St. John has a presence worldwide. Are these also eye clinics and hospitals or are they something else? Denise, do you want to talk a little bit about the structure of St. John worldwide? Yes, there is a prior... In summary, because it's super complicated, isn't it? <laughs> well, I must say there's no eye hospital um, anywhere. Um, I think in Kenya, they, they were talking about in Nairobi, possibly setting one up, but they haven't done it yet. Um, and in fact, I think in some of this, the Order of St. John, it's more that the ambulance is functioning, um, but um, they support our eye hospital extremely. And the Americans, I knew Joe Walsh, and he used to come, he was an ophthalmologist in New York. He used to come over and bring lots of equipment and, um, and a young anaesthetist also came over. But on the whole, um, they all help with giving money, which we badly need. Um, but apart from that, our eye hospital is the, really the only one. And the rest of the structure worldwide is um, other health services, such as ambulances, hospices, oh, yeah. and, and so forth, aid. right? First aid training. Yes, that's right. And we have someone on our, on our guild, a member. Um, she works for the, um, she's a doctor and um, gave us a first aid demonstration recently, which we had a guild event, which was very, very successful. And we can now recover very many people, which I hopefully, um, well, I, can, I think I can do, and there are lots of other people now. And she helps the um, ambulance in London <coughs> elsewhere. Thanks for that. Carla, we've got a question for you. What was it like filming the eye procedures? Were there difficulties in that? Um. Well, I, I guess that's one of the other, <laughs> speaking of during memories uh, uh, of, of the experience, uh, was just seeing, as you saw in the film, how uh, the intricacy of, of the eye operations, and yet 
in some ways, you, you know, you see them do this, and this is so, so delicate, so, and so, uh, uh, so um, intricate, and yet they just do it. They do it, and then they're on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Um, but I, I guess the, what we were trying to do was, um, I know the, the term squeamish was used, uh, you know, by jo Georgie at the beginning. Be, 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 be careful, because there are some images, quite graphic images, and I just wanted to say that uh, we, we felt that I'm not for, for graphic images in general as a filmmaker. I don't, I don't really like it. I'm a more sort of power of suggestion. But I think in this instance, I felt that it really was important to see just how intricate that work is in those operating theaters. Uh, you know, the, I mean, I'm just, just watching again how the, the artificial lens being placed in. I mean, this is it's extraordinary. I mean, miraculous almost. So. Um, so yes, we had to we had to obviously work very carefully because you know wait a second, they're working here, they're saving people's lives. We're just there as a <laughs> film camera crew, and, and uh, that that life that they're changing is the priority, not us, you know, filming. So obviously, being very respectful of, of the work involved, um, and going only as close as we could, and then we had to obviously take some of the imagery from uh, the camera that they have literally in the operating theater that's um, an extreme close-up of course a detail shot of the of the, the retina so uh, so we had to take those and, and and edit them into the imagery that we actually filmed as well because obviously we couldn't stick a camera right over that would have been, you know that would have been impossible in terms of the interference uh, involved with, with the surgery um, I was there with you. I was lucky to be there with you, Carlo, when we were yes. filming all of these scenes. Yes. And I can attest that it was very moving and we were all just amazed and impressed by the services being offered and the professionalism. It goes without saying, but it's worth saying. And um, again, we it wasn't gratuitous, the graphic images of that surgery. It was to show how amazing um, doing this kind of detailed work in such a small space and as this, Denise said earlier to do 12 in one morning that's 12 people's sight that's 12 grandparents that can see their grandparents their grandkids and help with childcare so the kids can go to work and it's, it's just life-changing isn't it and mm. especially with the cataract operations I think it's something we take for granted very much in this country because yes. um, cataracts are, are taken care of so quickly um, so they never get to, for most people in this country, they never get to be a, a severe problem that affects people's lives so dramatically. Whereas in Palestine, they do get, um, you know, there's lack of access and so forth. So the cataracts do get quite bad before they're treated. So um, it was amazing to watch, wasn't it? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Just riveting, riveting stuff. Um, I've got some questions coming in for Denise. Um, quite a few people want to know what's happening with COVID-19, how that's affecting the hospital specifically. So um, I don't know if you've got an, uh, an update for that. We are trying to get um, secure a date for a Zoom conference in the near future with Ahmed Mali, who was in the video, but when he was in the video, he was director of nursing and he's now the CEO, first Palestinian CEO, isn't he? So we're super proud of him. Um, so Denise, you've been in touch with him recently, haven't you? Has he given you any kind of update on the situation these days? Yes, he has. Ahmad Mali um, was trained as a nurse in the hospital quite a few years ago now. And he joined he was... us in 1990. Oh, sorry. And he, <laughs> comes, he comes from Janine, where his family is. Anyway, he did so well in the hospital that he became the nursing director, which it shows in, in the film. But since then, he is now um, the CEO and um, he is doing it extremely well. So that's that. And he gave this, well, he sent me his report the other day and I was telling you that the number of cases there are um, of the Palestinians having the virus. But luckily, none of the hospital staff have it. And um, this applies to all of the hospitals and clinics. There are six cases in another hospital in East Jerusalem, but not in ours. So that, that is excellent. I just wanted to say something about the cataract surgery um, that Carla was talking about. It's very intricate and actually it's quite a difficult operation, although it can be done if you're well trained, etc., cetera, um, in a very short time. And we have these young doctors that are with us for four years and they come knowing no ophthalmology at all. 
And at the end of the four years, they know a lot, and they're usually trained well in surgical procedures. Um, what you did see, which was really nice, is the Hadassah Hospital. So at the end of the four years, often one of the young doctors will go over to Hadassah to have further specialist training. And recently, one of them was trained in genetics. And um, so now he's returned and he's a geneticist, which is really very important because in a lot of these cases of cataracts, um, may, you know, babies can be born with cataracts. It's often due to consanguinity as such and first cousins marry first cousins. So that it's quite important to try to explain about um, possibly not doing necessarily doing that, but, but other than that, um, you know, what can happen. So he's, he's very good. And other people have been trained in many other things. And the um, Israelis, they like coming to our hospital because I think we have a, a terrific amount of eye pathology, but they have the academics, or we, we certainly, we do too, but they are very good. And Yakub Per, who you saw there, he's the head of the unit and he, he really enjoys um, having a Palestinian to train, etc. So it really works very well indeed. And to say more about the training, sorry, but the nurses, there's a nurse, you saw that as well, the um, training school for the nurses that's run by Nasrallah. And they have a year there and it's recognized by um, the 10th um, university over here. So they could always come over and work here if it was possible. So I hope that's answered some of those questions. Mm. You mentioned um, about the education side in terms of the patients. The mobile outreach is very good at, at holding workshops at the same time in the places they go on things like diabetic health, because diabetes affects eye care, um, and, um, and as you mentioned, cultural issues that affect eye problems and general first aid and eye first aid. So they're really good about spreading the word about that as well while they're treating people in these remote communities, aren't they? That's right. And of course, um, if a person needs to come to the hospital, you know, if he's had trauma, you see a lot of trauma, uh, they take them in the outreach van and they come back with us to the main hospital. They help any patients with any kind of permit issues if they need to have further treatment at one of the clinics and the hospitals, um, the mobile outreach staff will help them with those permits and so forth. So um, it's an amazing resource. Um, we've got some questions about the transition to Palestinian staff. Um, because I understand that in the past it was very much expats such as yourself, Denise. Um, uh -huh. And now we've got largely Palestinian staff in, in the senior medical roles and, and most of the medical roles, don't we? Yes, we do. Um, where, when I went out there, uh, quite a few senior registrars, that's the sort of grade before the consultant, would go out to the hospital, often from Moorfields. And I went out on a scholarship for a year. And I so enjoyed it that, um, well, uh, that's why I was out there for nearly 10 years, you see. But the thing is, um, we trained these, as we were saying, that we've trained many Palestinian doctors now, and they are extremely good. So we like doctors to go out just to do a little bit of training, maybe in the retina or something that um, will help them. But on the whole, the, the doctors are trained in each, many specialities. There was a general ophthalmology when I, well, when I was young, shall we say, but now they're super specialized that you'll find um, a doctor in the anti what's called the anterior segment. So there'll be one for cataracts, one for the cornea, one for glaucoma, one for corn the corneal grafts, etc., one for the diabetes. So you have to have a wide range. And we've got all those in Palestine um, in the hospital. So it, they're extremely good. But, and we used, when I was there, we actually had a doctor from America, from Canada, from Australia. It was like an international team, which was actually really very interesting. But nowadays, um, unless they have, they like to teach maybe for two weeks, it's not so necessary. That's, that's the reason. Although they did a wonderful job when they came. Thank you so much. And um, it's really interesting that you touched on the links with other UK hospitals, eye hospitals, um, and other institutions in the UK. As you mentioned, the nursing, um, the School of Nursing, which trains nurses. Um, gives them a one-year course to become specialist in um, ophthalmic nursing and that's accredited by Thames Valley University as you said and um, we still have very strong links don't we with Moorfields, Western Eye Hospital, um, people regularly coming out to observe but also to train and and to learn themselves right it's a two-way street isn't it? Well our hospital um, David Verity 
David. Who's here today? Hello, David. Oh, hello, David. David, hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Well, he's an optical um, plastic eye surgeon in Moorfield. And um, so he, he, he actually went out there as a student. Then he um, started doing eyes and um, uh, then he's ended up you know, at Moorfield and he looks after um, the hospitals. Fantastic. Um, right, we've got some amazing comments. I just want to say um, to all of you, um, to the panelists, that we've got some lovely pledges for support from different groups in St. John and in Mark Mason's. So, um, you know, you've done an amazing job in rallying the troops and, and so forth. And we really hope that um, everyone watching today has found it interesting. Um, I would like to ask Georgie to finish with um, a little word about the Guild and then maybe we'll take some final thoughts from the panelists. I'm sorry, we've had loads of questions and we haven't got around to all of them. I've tried to address everyone, um, all the different themes. So hopefully we've touched on them. If you've got any questions, um, follow-up questions, please do email guild at stjohneyehospital.org. Um, and if you want to talk about any kind of collaboration or donations, then please also um, follow us there. We've, I've posted the email in the chat box, so if you need to copy it and paste it, you can find it there. So Georgie, we'd love to pass over to you. Georgie is, as she said, the chair of the Guild, and the Guild have been going for almost 100 years, um, supporting the work of St. John. So over to you. Thank you, Diana, and thank you to everyone. And I just want to continue what Vanessa was saying about the mobile outreach, which is um, particularly close to the Guild Hearts and De Denise McGowan was very involved with that. It's something that the Guild was supporting through 2019 and is continuing in 2020. It's an absolutely vital service and it would be great to see that back on the road regularly and funding these other vans that have had to be decommissioned. So I just want to reinforce um, what Vanessa said and we saw in the film how fantastic that option is working in, in in very difficult situation in terms of access so thank you all for supporting the guild um very gentle ask to keep supporting the outreach you can see how vital those services are and um, thank you to everybody for joining today thank you to our panelists vanessa carlo and denise um, and thank you for supporting you. the first online event which is beautifully crafted and chaired by diana thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right. So, um, Vanessa, Carlo, Denise, um, if you've got any concluding remarks, final thoughts, um, we'd love to hear from the from you. Um, while I continue posting our donation link, hint, hint, <laughs> in the chat box. So, if you have found this interesting, then please do consider uh, making a donation. We'd really appreciate it. Um, and I've also included our um, mailing list. So if you want to sign up to find out about our future events, like I said, we hope to have Ahmed Mali, CEO, come and do one. And we've got some very exciting things in the pipeline. So uh, Vanessa, I'll pass over to you for your final thoughts. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Diana, because oh. you've done a fantastic job. I am completely bewildered by the Zooms and the webinars and, uh, all the countless phone numbers and so on. And I think you've crafted some, and I've got a few ideas which I'm not going to speak about because it would be wonderful. We'll talk later. <laughs> well, well, you learned very um, fast, Vanessa, so also, thank you so much. I also want to say that um, I, I feel I didn't explain myself properly. And I want to say you look beautiful. For some reason, the webinar sort of has produced a slightly Chinese look at the beginning. And I said that and I thought, oh my God, you've got to explain what you mean. But I, because it can't have sounded like a compliment. Did but explain I, to everyone that wasn't there at the time. I, that, I was out of sync and looking a bit like a Kung Fu film, wasn't I, with the translation <laughs> on top. Yes, but you've done such a great job. Oh, this it's Georgie and the Guild. It's Georgie so, and the Guild. Oh, no, you don't want to say something. Well, thank you, Vanessa and Carlo. We'd love to hear your concluding thoughts. Well, I, just conclusion 
mine is just I hope to be involved, to continue to be involved with St. John you know, for many, many years to come. And uh, maybe one day we'll make another film. I don't know. It'd be lovely to do that. Um, it would just be a great, sequel? great, great <laughs> privilege. Not a sequel, no. <laughs> Not a, no, no, no. I would have loved to hear, and I think there might be, you know, what measures were taken to prevent COVID-19 getting hold of the, um, the, the, the disease, getting hold of the stop mm. in St. John's, because we didn't hear about that. And I think it could be that something in that line would be where we could be helpful. Well, Denise, that sounds like a good um, final comment for you to address. Right. Well, first of all, I'd just like to thank Vanessa and Carlo, because if they hadn't have made that film, we wouldn't have even been having this webinar, you see. So <laughs> it was really very, very good. And um, actually, you've been amazing, Diana, Diana, and you've organised it all so well, it's terrific. And Georgie, who's our chairman of the Guild, um, is doing a wonderful job. But I'd just like to say about the COVID, it's difficult to explain that, but I think it's because of the lockdown situation that um, uh, partly, and also maybe the weather in, in the heat. I don't think the, the virus likes hot weather, and it's usually very good climate out there. Um, and, and, and it's difficult to explain that because even when we listen to all every day here about the virus, they don't understand it and how it spreads or how. But anyway, luckily it didn't. So, uh, but, but maybe Ahmed, when he comes next, mm. when he's coming soon, he can explain that. Um, and actually, I would, I would just like to say um, to thank all the staff in the hospitals and the clinics for what they do. Even getting to the hospital is very tricky. They have to get up very early in the morning and go through goodness knows how many checkpoints to there. And they're doing a wonderful job. And hopefully it will, the hospital will continue forever, shall we say. All right, Teresa, I just proceed. Well, they've been going for a long time. So um, mm. they're definitely very good at, at overcoming obstacles. Um, I would like to do a quick thank you to the Balfour Project. We've got some of the representatives here. Sir Vincent Fien, who used to be a St. John trustee and former uh, Consul General to Jerusalem. And they very kindly let us host um, the event on their Zoom. Um, so not sure if that's technically allowed, but it happened. And so we're very grateful to be able to um, hold this event in this way with all of you here. And, um, and Denise, thank you so much for your medical knowledge and your knowledge of St. John in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and Vanessa yeah. and thank Carlo. Um, we had a little saying when I was working in the office of St. John, you're St. John for life. Um, it's very hard to extract yourself from the organization. So you're one of us now and, um, and we are very happy to have you on board and we're really grateful that you made the film in the first place and that even all these years later, you have agreed to do this event with us and um, I will share all the comments with you. I should have said that um, to all you attendees that the panelists are not looking at the comments because it can be quite overwhelming. So I'm relaying the information and I will share all of your lovely comments with them um, after the fact. But you've had so many comments about people finding the film so interesting and so grateful for your involvement. Same with um, the Guild ladies. I would like to say thank you to the Guild because this is a team of volunteers um, and this volunteer week this week, by the way, so happy volunteer week um, for doing such amazing events uh, for almost a century to fundraise for St. John, which is such a worthwhile organization, which has brought all these wonderful people together as well. So um, I just want to say thank you once again, and um, please do sign up to the mailing list. I've put the link in the chat. Um, please email us, guild at stjohneyehospital.org if you want to get involved with us or want to find out about upcoming events. And we really hope to see you all um, at a future event. And we're really grateful that you came along today. So. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you, Georgie and Thank Denise. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Cameo Bye -bye. from Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>